uh, I wasn't really actively like discovering, you know. Um, I think as a little kid, I was just turned on by what I heard on the radio and mostly uh, Radio Fusion because I grew up listening to Radio Fusion and that was a time when Radio Fusion that was a time when Radio Fusion was the only truly progressive pop music station because there was no really like 24 hour pop on the radio I think that's something we now take for granted but back then there was really no pop station we only had Radio 1 and Radio 1 was operated like BBC Radio mostly like 70% magazine programs and 30% pop music, you know. Um, so I discovered um, the music scene here only when I started a band and became more aware of the chances of uh, performing and where I could perform. That's when I kind of uh, realized what the scene was about. Because basically I was just, you know, a music fan. I wouldn't care about the scene here. And then I, sadly, I think I was uh, aware that in the 60s, there was a lot of uh, happening music because I switched on the radio, you hear a lot of local bands, but by the 70s all that was gone because of the stringent uh, um, regulations and government agenda. So all the music kind of died basically. And to me, I would say uh, it was marked by the advent of Woodstock, the whole flower power revolution. I think that really scared off our government. So I would say that what I considered uh, Singapore to be the Dark Ages started from 1969 onwards when Woodstock happened. So that was when the big clampdown happened, clubs were closed um, and radio was not allowed to play amplified blues rock music which was the music of its day back then and then you wouldn't see anything on television uh, either you know. So uh, yeah, I, yeah but mainly it's because I was I started playing music um, towards the end of the 70s when I was invited by Damien Sin to be in uh, in his band called Transformer. No, I was never. I, well, I, I I was I took uh, guitar lessons once because my mother uh, th thought I was interested in the guitar, so she put me in a class to learn classical music which was like, Bleh. so of course I fell out after a while. So I never really had formal musical training. And I guess that's why I was so influenced by punk rock. Because when Patti Smith came along, I always say this, if Patti Smith could sing, anyone could sing. So I guess it was Patti Smith who inspired me to have the dare to be on stage to perform and to sing, even though, you know, I had no, little singing capabilities, you know. I think right till now I'm still more a, what you call a punk voice yeah well you know no there, there was a real clamp down there was actually very very little uh, uh, chance for uh, um, so-called indie bands or uh, bands playing original music to thrive uh, actually there were no places you know um, national theater had a rule uh, that they could not perform rock concerts there but there was a little loophole and that was um, uh, there were people who organized charity concerts so they had a lot of charity concerts in the national theater and they happened to be rock music <laughs> so that was the loophole other than that were, there were really no no venues i remembered even like in the uh, late 70s early 80s when um, when the band i was in transformer uh, was hoping to have a platform a stage we used to hang out in the bars along Orchard Road and waited for the resident band to take a break and then we volunteered to play 10 minutes you know and felt it was like oh thank god yeah so there were there were no venues at all none well yeah like all bands at the time uh, we all wanted to be rock stars uh, you know so I guess when Damien formed the band asked me to perform with him I guess that was that was a thing it felt wonderful I remembered the whole feeling was like, wow, I'm in a band. Uh, I'm whole, part of this whole, you know, rock star uh, machinery thing. Um, I remember I started smoking even, you know, that sort of thing. It was like a, a kind of social liberation for, for me. Uh, and I have to say that it felt very different from now because now because of the whole punk revolution and people are thinking DIY and uh, 
and independent, it's a different feeling. Back then it was like no such thing as DIY or independent. You start a band, you hope to get signed by the record company. That's how it worked. So we had that kind of outlook and sensibility all the time. We were hoping to be rock stars. I am a failed rock star. Yeah, we were as well. Yeah, we were. We covered a lot of Deep Purple, Thin Lizzy. Um, we sang Steppenwolf, Born to be Wild, stuff like that, you know. But we also wrote some original material because we recognized the virtue of punk and progressive rock music. Uh, I think in that we were different. And eventually, when the band grew to be evolved uh, and morphed into Zircon Lounge, we were definitely uh, championing the whole uh, punk and new wave movement in, in rock music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it wasn't the norm. The norm back then was to do cover songs because, you know, back then it was blues, rock and amplified, psychedelic music. So if you play that music, it really meant that you are a rebel, you have Western decadent culture in you. So that is the reason why it was not allowed in Singapore. Yeah. For very good reasons, of course. We must have started in late 70s um, because I think I was in Transformer for at least a couple of years and then it broke up. We uh, must have taken at least a year uh, to fall, to really firm up Zircon Lounge before we released uh, the first album, Riga Viga, in 83. So given a year, like maybe we started uh, 81, 82, so Transformer must have been late 70s. Yeah. Uh, actually, even as Transformer, we played uh, some notable gigs uh, thanks to the fact that I was famous. <laughs> I was the EMI uh, resident DJ when they had an EMI showcase on radio at the time. So I was the resident DJ and because of that, uh, we landed uh, gigs that were, were not open to other people. Like for instance, we actually opened for Anita Sarawak's launch of a second German album, For the Love. Uh, and then I remembered after we played, the EMI MD from Britain said, he should never have been allowed to play because they were crass and crude. Yeah, and vulgar. <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, we were just lucky that I was a uh, known, uh, known figure. And I suppose that's how it was, because even when Zircon Lounge was signed and released by WEA, um, they re don't forget they released the album Zircon Lounge featuring Chris Ho. It's almost like without my name, they wouldn't have released the album. You know, so, yeah. No, because our kind of music was not considered commercial. And uh, unless you have, you, you tag along a, a so-called known public figure or someone famous, sort of famous, the record company wouldn't be interested, you see. They need to sell albums, basically, you know. They need to make money. And that's the reason why... And that's the reason why... Uh, and that's the reason why Dick Lee was roped in as a co-producer of Zircon. So in order to tame us a little bit, uh, but but it worked out well because I, I thought that Dick really made an important musical contribution to the Zircon Lounge album. Uh, he gave it the keyboard. Uh, layering that we didn't have yeah. i'm very proud and happy to have had dick on the album actually well dick was already known because he had by that time released live story and he had uh, performed on tv often enough uh, and he was i think about to release his uh, life in the lion city first wea album so he was a known entity in music and besides his music is definitely more mainstream, more acceptable. So he was <clears throat> um, definitely more uh, uh, an investment than a liability. Uh, I think Zircon was pretty much a big risk uh, to enter in Tula. Yeah. Of course it was hard um, because the culture of original music, original Singapore English pop bands had died. I mean you have to remember that back in the 70s the famous uh, pop 
artists of the time were people like Anita Sarawak and Tracy Huang. They were your two biggest selling acts, basically. Uh, there, there were hardly any really like adventurous rock bands, apart from maybe a couple of them, like Western Union Band, Fly Bays, that were recorded. Uh, there were uh, bands that were not recorded, like Pest Infested. Uh, what's the other one called? I forgot. Uh, there were some other, but those were considered to be more uh, your uh, underground blues rock band, you know, that had no commercial value. Because after all, radio was not allowed to play that kind of music. So the whole sensibility of uh, people appreciating local music and local artists were gone, were wiped out. We were actually just doing it for the love and inspiration of punk, basically. You know, we were wishing against all, hoping against all odds that we'll get somewhere. But by the look of things, it wasn't going to get anywhere anyway. I mean, they didn't even have the right kind of producer uh, or engineer or studio to accommodate the, the, the Zircon Lounge Regal Vigor album. I remembered when we went in, we had to bring in our own uh, snare drum because they had put in uh, sacks of sand inside, the, inside the, the, the snare drum to soften the sound of the snare drum because it was meant to have the Tracy Huang sound. Drums cannot be cracklingly loud, no. And I remember when, when we kept telling the engineer, turn up the sound of the guitar, he was like, it's already maximum, uh, like that. And we used to laugh about it. But that was really how it was. It was not easy. I mean, but that's why the Zircon Lounge Regal album, Regal Vigor album, uh, sounded so murky and so in a sense, uh, not what we wanted, because there really was no, uh, no experience in that field to record music of our nature. Uh, we were the very first, you know. Uh, yeah, back then in the West, you had, yeah, the whole punk explosion, you had the Romeo Void, the REM and the U2, but in Singapore, all that didn't happen, you know. People didn't know all that music. People were just still listening to, at most, Deep Purple, Grand Funk, you know, that sort of thing. They didn't know the whole punk new wave sensibility at all. That was frowned upon, in fact. Yeah, yeah uh, I think Big O did a lot. It happened that Big O, like us, was very punk inspired. So they created the whole uh, culture um, by way of print. Uh, and, and they were the original uh, and only fanzine at the time of rock music before they actually went into full publication as a magazine. So they organized the No Surrender gig uh, for a bunch of bands. And by that time, I think there were a few that came up. Myself, there was uh, Odd Fellows, there was uh, um, Joe Earn's first group that I named. What's it called? Corporate Toil. Corporate toil. <laughs> yes. So, you know, there were bands like that uh, coming up. So. I think by that time we were heard and then with Big O, uh, people were a little bit more aware of the music. So I think people went definitely a bit more um, uh, aware and accepting of the music that was going to be played. Unlike say when we performed, uh, unlike say like, when we performed at the Anita Sarawak gig, I think uh, people went and watched and like, what the hell are they doing? They can't even pr play properly, you know. Even though to us it was like, that's the point, that's the point. <laughs> but you know, so it wasn't, yeah. They At least the No Surrender gig was geared for that audience. But I think when we played the Nita Sarawa gig, it was quite wrong, uh, you know, quite, quite wrong. Ah, by that time we were in Zircon Lounge and again, because I was a DJ on Ready Fusion and they were organizing a gig uh, near the Padang, so they asked us to perform solely because I was working for Ready Fusion, you know. So, and I had the idea, uh, well, okay, the, uh, by and large it's going to be a huge portion of the audience who are listening to Chinese programs on Ready Fusion. So, let's pander to them by appearing in Chinese Wayang costume <laughs> because I know they're not going to appreciate our music, you know? So, yeah, that was what it, what it was. Uh, 
It was our way of at least trying to connect with the audience. Yeah. Musically, we weren't about to. Just appearance-wise, that is. Yeah. And besides, I mean, I grew up uh, on Chinese Wayang. My maternal grandfather uh, is a famous uh, China opera actor. He always was the lead. So I guess uh, when I was growing up, my grandmother used to take me to Chinese opera. So there was always that side of me as well. And people used to tell me that when I sang in Zircon Lounge, my hands were full of Chinese Wayang movements, you know. That's in my, that's in me, I guess, my background, yeah. Oh, everything was by chance. I've told this story many times. I was a music fan, listening to Radio Fusion, and then they had this program where they invited people to come on to the show to present their own dedications and songs. So I took part and completely forgot about it. And then maybe eight, ten months or a year later, they were looking for part-timers and they had my contact because I took part in that show. So they rang me up and said, would you like to be a, a part-time DJ? You know, you just have to come in for an audition. And they're okay, you know. So I was interview I was auditioned by Mike Ellery and then I was accepted and that's how it happened. Everything always happened by chance, by way of music for me, my career. Um, and then that went on to the next phase of starting a band. Uh, I was in, I used to go to the Supreme Music Store, record store a lot in Lucky Plaza at the time. And then the owners, the boss's wife, who was running the place said, oh, there's another music fan who's a big fan of Deep Purple. He likes to meet up with you and talk music, blah, blah, blah. So would you like to meet him? I thought, sure, sure, sure. So I met him in the shop and he turned out to be Damien Sin. So he asked me to join the band. I said, okay, you know, so it was my chance again. And then as for writing about music as a music critic for Straits Times, because Mick Jagger came to town, he was staying at the Hyatt Hotel. Believe it or not, at the time, there were only three people interested in interviewing Mick Jagger, myself, Vernon Cornelius of the Quest and Richard Lim, who was the editor of Straits Times Live section. So that was where I met Richard for the very first time, when we were both waiting while Vernon was interviewing Mick Jagger. And, uh, and then, uh, so while I was waiting, I started talking to Richard and then Richard uh, asked if I would like to write a column for Straits Times. And I said, uh, okay, I'll try. And he liked the style of writing, that's how I ended up. Because nothing was in that sense planned. Everything, I think God really wanted me to be a DJ. And God really wanted Big O to feature my article, so eventually I'll be talking about Singapore. It's God's plan and work, please don't blame me. Oh, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, Philip uh, Cha uh, knew about my Radio Fusion uh, shows and knew that I had this big love and inclination towards punk music. So he interviewed me, I think, for a big old fanzine. I think it might have been the first issue. And then it just took off from there. We became friends. So I started writing a regular column, all that. Everything was just by chance. But actually not lah, it's God's plan. You just don't believe me, that's all. Yeah, um... Well, kind of, Zircon kind of dissolved and then I didn't know, uh, actually no, right after Zircon dissolved, WEA had already plans to sign me as a solo artist, which they did. So I think like two years after it dissolved, uh, I started recording my solo album, Night Songs in Day Glow, that was followed up with uh, Punk Bang Hung. But when Pony Canyon died, uh, Close Shop, uh, it really was like, oh dear, no more recording avenues. I remember even Najib turned to me and said, Najib Ali turned to me and said, how are Chris? No more record companies to record us I said, I don't know. And then I think uh, Big O had the idea after my first book to release a spoken word CD. So fortunately, for, from uh, because of that, I came out with my spoken word CD, which Little of Furious designed the wonderful cover of, the one called um, uh, Chris with an X, Me All Good, No Bad. Uh, so that became my first spoken word CD, and that kind of uh, led me on to uh, all the three, the trilogy of albums I did for, uh, released on Warner uh, in the 2090s after Zircon Gap Porn Stars. Yeah. So, in a sense, I kind of like <laughs> plundered on a little bit, not quite knowing what to do, but as fate would have it, 
as a failed pop star, I fell right into my own little underground. <laughs> of course, not underground, the stomping ground way, lah. You know me, <laughs> to auntie for that. Again, it was kind of uh, not my design. One day, I bumped into him. I remember at that Riverside Cafe in uh, Robertson Key area called Tamat. <laughs> I don't even remember it. Um, and he said, hey, Chris, let's form Zircon again. I was like, huh? And then, of course, I really don't like the idea of reunion bands. So because of that, uh, I came up with the idea to do Electro and then to rename it. So that was what Zircon Gov was about. It was a very exciting period because also for me, it really felt like uh, a second chance at, um, at, at, I don't know, trying to win pop acceptance, you know. It was the most pop of my work after the two solo albums, you know. So, yeah, it was like almost like a second shot. And I thought we were doing okay. Uh, and then, unfortunately, the band just fell apart. Uh, Yao was the first to leave. And then after that, Suzanne uh, Susu Law, uh, who was just starting out in acting in... Uh, on Channel 5, I think she must have thought that she had a good thing going with acting. So, cannot associate myself with Zircon Gapon stars. Chris, Zircon is not my thing. So that was the end of it. I think, um, in a sense, you have to really, really credit Mr. Jimmy Wee in a super big way. Without Jimmy Wee, there would have been no Dick Lee phenomenon. There would have been no Jacinta, there would have been no Lizard's Convention, there would have been no Humback Oak first album. There were so many things that Jimmy believed in because all he really wanted was local music to be heard. And he really put his money where his heart was, you know, to release these albums by local bands at a time when it was considered foolish and stupid and completely impractical to, to release them because there was no market. But he believed in it. So it always goes back down to that one person who believed in it. In the same way that I'm, I'm proud to say that back when at Ready Fusion, I was the only person who believed in punk music. Okay, there was also Gail Chin, but she left. And I was the only one. So because of that, I pushed for the music on, on, Ready, on Ready Fusion. And people don't know this, but I got into a whole lot of trouble as well. Anyway, yes. so uh, it always goes back down to whoever believes in it and the person happens to be in a position to do something. I think that's the most important thing. You know, it's like Little who believes in this exhibition. So he starts it, he forms it, he organizes it. So, I mean, maybe someone else would do it, but then, you know, it's important that somebody is there to provide that platform. And Jimmy Wee really was the guy. You, you, you easily can say he was the music, local music, entrepreneur of Singapore and should be acknowledged as a huge founding father of the music scene. Without him, all the music that you heard in the 70s and 80s would not have existed, even in the 90s. We, we really all owe, owed it to, to Jimmy. We really do, in a super big way. I think the government was very, very smart. When they real, realized that there was the advent of internet and when they also realize that Singapore has to go through some changes because we our commerce industry is a little uh, overripe and they have to turn to new ways of uh, of uh, reviving or, or rather pumping up the economic uh, uh, the, the economy of Singapore they turn to casinos and all that and I think all that happened at a time in the 90s when it was time to call for a slight modification so the government was very clever to come up with this hip and funky. We are now hip and funky. So what that means is, let's forget that we were horrible. Basically, that's really what it means, all right? So now actually the kids don't realize 
the history we had when music was being killed off. Because they grew up thinking, oh, your government was already hip and funky, but why you say that we are very horrible and restrictive? Not at all, you really are doing injustice to the government, you know. So it really wasn't like that. They were very clever with this big turnaround agenda. Hip and funky, of course, everything was on the surface, lah, but that was good enough. Good enough to make the young people not realize what the scene was like before. So people, of course, now don't realize, but they only wonder, how come uh, yeah, our people don't appreciate local music? Huh? Yeah, lah, it's all our fault. Lah. And number one, number two, maybe our music not good enough, all that blah, 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 blah. blah. They never really go to the source. You cannot go to the source, okay? We're talking about the PAP government. So, because of that, the whole scene is different now. People are more anxious to regroom the music industry because it, it was non existent. And because they are not aware of, of the history, they just feel, on the one hand, uh, they should do more. And then I think with those who are aware, they really want to rebuild it. People like myself, you know. Okay, lies in the past, but something has got to be done, you know, if you believe in music, that is. So I think in that sense, now there are a lot of avenues, so many avenues, even radio. You know, okay, just to give you a bit of a history, huh? do you know that back then, uh, if you want to put an indie band on the air, it would have been the most atrocious thing you could think of. I remember it, and I'm not being like horrible about it. Back then, it really was like, cannot, we cannot just anyhow put an indie band, no. They sing out of tune, the guitar is not tuned properly. Uh, properly. Then people will question and people will uh, cast nasty remarks about radio programming. Cannot. So the whole scene is different now. Now there's actually this big enthusiasm to feature indie music, which is really good. But that's what it should have been. That's what it should have been. After all, SG50 is a great thing. I wouldn't want to put it down. So I'd like to think that I might have some positive contribution. But yeah, like, it depends on how much I have a sellout law. <laughs> Got money, can. After all, I go with the John Waters school of thinking. I was never again selling out. Nobody wants to buy, that's all. And it's so sad if you think about me. I gave my whole life to building this punk culture as good as LKY in building the nation. So why shouldn't I be credited? So yes, SG50, come on, bring it on. Give me the load and the money. <laughs>